Hi, my name is Aran Horvat. In this video we will continue our pursuit for the code that contains no bugs. We will introduce assertions as a method to demonstrate that the code is correct, as I have put it in the title, as it runs. You will learn that there is really no such thing as correct code. So in this video we will effectively try to prove or to demonstrate that the code is aligned with the requirements at least, and so that there is no discrepancy between the requirements and what the code is doing. Please subscribe to my channel, don't forget to tick the bell to receive notifications when new videos are uploaded, and if you like what you learn in this video, you can also find a lot of resources at Pluralsight, Udemy and Udemy for Business where I have published tons of videos explaining concepts of object-oriented and functional programming, mostly in .NET and C-sharp. Now straight to the topic. This is the code from the previous video. If you have missed the previous two episodes on this same theme, the theme of writing code that has no bugs, please find links in the description. In the first episode we have developed a piece of code, a function which implements the quick sort algorithm. And in the second video, we have effectively proven that this function is working as requested, if not correct again. There is that question of correct code. For example, your code is executing on a virtual machine, which is translating intermediate language code to bare machine code. How do you know that everything will execute as you expect in the first place? You cannot tell. For example, the runtime is dependent on the memory model which is defined for .NET. Does it work as expected? Is there a bug there? If the memory model is not delivering what you expect, what, what the documentation says, how can you know that your application is working correctly? on any machine in the world. There are also random events. A high energy photon can hit the memory bank and switch a bit. So we have proven that certain inequalities will be satisfied, but what if, if a bit in memory is, is uh, inverted and out of nowhere 2 becomes larger than 3? There is no proof that the code will work correctly. So we are done with that. What we can, if not prove, then at least assert, is that code is doing what the requirements are asking for. Did you prove that the propositions from requirements are complete and never collide with each other? Probably not. So we are constantly lowering the bar of the definition of correctness, as you can see. And the most we can do in the end is to just test the propositions from the requirements as we have them. Given the requirements, we have implemented a proof. We have entailed the proof which is based on proving that attributes of the solution hold in certain points. And now we ask the question, should we do that in every single function we write? I mean, this makes sense in a very sensitive piece of code, like the piece of code that is calculating money. It makes sense to prove security attributes on a very sensitive piece of code. What can we do in the end, if not proving every piece of domain logic we implement, and if not, just using the common sense to say, yeah, this, this function, yeah, it's good, I think it's good. Is there anything in between? Yes, there is. Assertions. Look, we can replace every single comment I made here, which must hold true, with a piece of code which evaluates that condition and tells us whether the function at the runtime is really in the state as we expect it. 
This is a very interesting idea. And it's quite different from, for example, unit testing. In unit testing, you, you see a function and you can test whether before and after it executes the state of the system or the result returned by the function satisfies certain propositions. But you don't know what's happening inside. And that is where the bugs hide. So we want to try to get inside the function and probe its state as it executes and to see if something goes wrong there because the function might, by pure chance, return the correct result even if, if it is substantially wrong. So we want to change these assertions to turn them into executable code that will run as the function executes. There is a solution for that in .NET. I will add reference to system.diagnostics namespace. That is where the assertions are implemented. You will make an assertion by calling the assert static function on the debug class, giving it a Boolean predicate to check. I will just make it fail. And optionally giving it a message to display when the check fails. If I run the program, look, it will fail. And it says process terminated, assertion failed. This is much worse than throwing an exception. If you throw an exception, it doesn't mean that the process will terminate. You can handle an exception and keep going. With assertions, it's not that easy. You cannot just catch an assertion. By the way, this assertion is also containing a stack trace, just as the, the exception would. And in a GUI program, you would see a pop-up window, a modal window that stops execution of the program and asks you what to do, whether to abort, to terminate the process, or to just keep going, so it's your decision at runtime. In a console application, this is what you will see, the, the console printout. Let me run the application again, this time in the release build. Look, there's no assertion check. Assertions are only checked in debug build, and in the release build, they are removed entirely. There is no check, there is not even a line that calls the assert method in the release build. So that any costly checks you make in the assert method, in the assert call, will not be there in the release build, and your release build will be as fast as it ever was and you will be able to probe your function in the debug build to catch bugs. Another important aspect of assertions is, as I mentioned, you cannot just catch them. If you use exceptions to indicate situations that you consider a bug, you might throw an exception to indicate that, but somebody might catch that ex exception even not knowing what it is, and keep going. With assertions, it goes the other way around. The assertions are passed to trace listeners, so there is the way to handle them and ignore that an assertion has happened, to keep going, if you wish. But that gives you the opportunity to, for example, handle assertions, catch them, and log them into a separate log file, which is only for the bugs. And if anything happens, if anything appears in that log, you know that there is a bug, and there will be a stack trace telling you the line at which the bug has manifested. There is an entirely new level of debugging applications compared to traditional manual debugging or with unit testing. I will remove this line and we will get to the business. The business of transforming these assertions that I made in comments into proper debug assertions. For one thing, we cannot check termination. You know that the proper proof of correctness of a function proves two things. One is that it is doing what is expected, and the other is that it terminates. 
we don't need a function that ends up in a in an infinite loop. But you cannot assert termination if you got to the to, to a specific line, like the line where you return uh, the result. <laughs> then it will terminate. There's nothing to assert. And if you didn't get to that line, then the debug assert will not execute again. So there is no way to assert that the function is, termin is terminating. I will just delete these termination conditions wherever I find them. I will move post conditions where they are really in effect, at the return instruction. This is where the post condition must hold. And this post condition is for this function, let me put it at the very end of the function. This is where this condition must be true. And now, how do we assert that these attributes are true? For example, make sure that uh, the non-greater element always precedes the one that, that follows. That is the, the assertion that the function is producing a sorted list. So let me run the function. This is the release build and it passes fine. Specifically, pay attention to timing. It's the same as it was because there is really no assertion in release build and nothing was checked. But when I started in debug mode, you will notice a significant rise in the running time. That is because the function is this time checking the assertion, so every call to sort an array will also have one additional pass for the array to check whether it is effectively sorted after execution. There are certain considerations to keep in mind when using assertions in code. For one thing, the condition check should not have side effects. If you change the state of the system while asserting then that change will only happen in debug build, but it will be removed in release build. So what can happen if you forgot this uh, rule that you effectively check code in debug build and everything is all right, and then compile it in um, release and you inject a bug into it. So we move to the next function, which is the crux of the solution we have inherited from the previous video. There is nothing to check in the trivial case, but we must assert that the length is strictly greater than one after it, because the rest of the function assumes it is strictly greater than one. You can almost copy and paste all these attributes we made before. This condition looks important. It is checking the boundaries of lower and upper bound before partitioning the array in the quick sort algorithm. That brings us to the most complex part of this algorithm, the partitioning. I will leave that for the next video because there will be quite a lot of work to fix this. There's so much code here and even more assertions to make. It won't be easy, so we will cover that in a separate video because it will not just be to substitute these comments with, with assertions. We will need to sustain complexity of the, the final solution and huge performance issues. So in this video you have learned how to use assertions, but that is just a basic case. In the next video we will move to the advanced case of using assertions, where you will learn that there are many problems to solve as you go and we will eventually solve them, you will see. I hope you enjoyed this video. See you in the next episode where we will apply assertions to the entire complex function and make them pretty and fast. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and watch my video courses at Pluralsight and Udemy. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.